the stage is yours. Great. So thank you, Nathan, uh, and welcome everybody once again uh, for our fourth knowledge sharing session. Uh, it has been uh, really interesting for us uh, as KTHI Society to organize these uh, sessions and uh, prepare for them because um, um, it's like we are also recording, so you can always uh, go back to our recording. We'll be sharing the links uh, very soon uh, to look at, look at any particular topic that you are interested in. Um, so without further ado, let's start with today's uh, topic. Uh, it is uh, contrastive learning. So uh, as, I, as you must have seen in the topic description, uh, we'll be talking about a type of representation uh, learning. And <clears throat> contrastive learning is, uh, is one way to do that. Uh, it is very recent and uh, has been very successful. So which is why we chose to um, pick this topic uh, for today's um, session. And uh, we'll be, so today we'll be focusing on one framework uh, which has like got the best uh, results and is the state of the art in this field. Uh, and then we'll be comparing uh, this framework with uh, other frameworks that has uh, that we have seen these publications, especially in the last uh, two years. And uh, somewhere in the middle of my presentation, I'll be um, giving you guys, I think about two to three applications, uh, how this can be used in the real world. So um, this is how, uh, so let's, let's begin with contrastive learning framework. Uh, if you are interested, you can always uh, look at this paper by uh, Chenting, uh, it is called SIM CLR, the Simple Framework for Contrastive Learning of Visual Representations. So this is uh, this is from 2020. So uh, this is the structure. Today uh, we'll be looking at some key takeaways. Then we'll set the premise for our uh, topic. So there's this data revolution and growing needs, and then uh, we'll we'll find a problem in this premise as to uh, what what these deep learning models have difficulties uh, today. It's not just about how good your model is or uh, or how close are you to the ground truth, but it is always also about uh, what are the ingredients for your own model. So we'll be looking at these such problems, uh, problems uh, you know, relevant for uh, data and um, the kind of data that, that is available for us. And uh, we'll be looking at one of the solution, uh, which is again, contrastive learning, a type of representation learning, um, so we, we phrase that as let's use all of our data effectively. And, uh, as mentioned, we'll be looking at one framework that does this job, uh, called SimCLR. It's just the simple framework for contrastive learn, uh, learning of visual representation. We'll be looking at some examples and then we will conclude, uh, with the Q and A session. Uh, so when I'm, when I've been mentioning contrastive learning or representation learning, it's basically um, what you learn through your data. So in, in layman's uh, term, um, or terminology, it's about uh, whatever data you feed into your uh, network, it has to basically get rid of all the redundant, inf redundant information um, and, um, and basically um, choose the right features which uh, are um, most useful to basically do the downstream tasks uh, which could be, um, let's say, classification or regression or something uh, relevant. So that is what we uh, refer to here as representation. Uh, and we need to, so whenever we, we deal with any machine learning uh, model, it's basically uh, we are trying to get more and more representations uh, learned in our, in, our, uh, in our neural network or any, any model that you're working with. So... The key takeaways are uh, obviously the big data revolution is a is a double edged sword. So it has on on one end it's it has uh, changed the way we look at many applications today. Uh, many applications that we use on a day to day basis have been like radically changed uh, due to uh, these um, research that has been done in machine learning, deep learning, and all other relevant fields. But then it also has uh, many challenges that uh, we have been uh, we have been facing quite recently or like getting to know about these challenges uh, more recently so we need to find uh, ways to to deal with this challenges so uh, as you, as you see on youtube or any 
other social media platform we have uh, immense amount of unstructured data that is not labeled uh, and we need to basically find out ways how we can use such uh, such uh, such amount of data effectively so um, so the problem again reiterating that that we have insufficient uh, labeled data and it involves um, manual uh, labeling tasks uh, i think you if you are in this domain you must have heard that there are many uh, larger organizations hiring uh, people to just uh, label the data using different tools and there has been research i think not recently but a few years ago there have been um, good amount of research where people have worked on just developing these tools uh, which can you know just uh, effectively label your data but now um, i think um, we uh, are looking at alternative methods which are more efficient so how can we even not label and still be able to um, capture most important features so uh, i've been mentioning uh, quite often that we need a lot of data so let's go look at one interesting example and uh, and look at how much data did they need so open ai is a company from uh, the silicon valley and uh, they recently modeled, uh, they recently published an article on GPT-3, which is generative pre-trained transformer a type of recurrent neural network. It's the version three. And what it does is basically the language model. Uh, the simplest example could be uh, when you use Gmail or uh, when you're uh, typing uh, in your own phone using this Google key keyboard uh, keypad, it basically, uh, you know, suggests you the next uh, word. And this could be also, and it also it's also very effective even if you're uh, writing in uh, in a language which is which is kind of mixed when you, in your own native language and English. So, for example, when I'm writing in Hindi and English, uh, it, it can still effectively remember based on my you know previous inputs. So, this is what like one example what a language model can do. Obviously, it can do much more complex tasks. So, when this model was trained, it needed 175 billion parameters so parameters are something that you learn uh, when you are basically fitting your model uh, with the with the given data but what's more uh, what i want to highlight here is what was it trained on so here's a list of things a uh, common crawl consisting like 410 billion uh, encoded tokens uh, well um, so just i mean what we can instead of going in the details of what each word means we can just look at the numbers so just to simplify it quite a bit for you token would be like some string of characters basically let's say a word between spaces so four 410 billion of common crawl 19 billion tokens from something called web text another 67 billion from books 3 billion from wikipedia and god knows what else so this is what they needed to train this gpt3 and uh yes now it is it has made the de the headlines and uh, everybody is basically talking about it you know you if you follow the right people youtube must be filled with um, videos of talking about gpt3 and its capabilities and so on so this is what we need and this is kind of the data uh, we need to come up with the most uh, effective or at least the the models that would change the game and so we need the data but um, that data needs to be labeled because I mean, there has been research, uh, obviously one can argue that uh, there is something called un unsupervised learning, we can do clustering and so on. But I mean, uh, research is driven by, uh, you know, uh, novelties and how effective are you uh, on that approach uh, and how better are you from on that approach based on the previous results. So um, this is where um, we, we would like to address this, that how can we label this? And often the times the labeling process is manual it's time expensive, it's man manpower expensive, and we just need to automate uh, this process. So for this, I have, uh, let we can play a little game. Um, so this is one of the, so this is somewhat re relevant to the, the research that we will be discussing today. Uh, so this is a very, um, you know, um, a predefined example. It's not uh, very broad, but I mean, I think it should, it just like, um, gets the idea um, it, it tries to I mean I'm trying to explain the idea through this example 
where um, let's say we have one picture on the left of a smiley on a, on, in a yellow box and then there are four images on the right and then we want to just uh, if, if we give this task to a human I think human would be very uh, quick with an answer that it will choose the bottom right uh, which is kind of a cropped uh, version of the original image and there is some color distortion there is there's some gray part in the bottom so uh, although but despite all these changes in the image we would still be effective in choosing this one instead of the other three cartoon characters so uh, today's example is going to be somewhat revolving around uh, this kind of task um, so basically you can call it as matching the correct pair or whatever else you want to name it so in this uh, what if you were uh, look choosing a manual labeling approach what you would do is you would have two mr beans uh, and then uh, what we would do is okay this is the source image and then it is the similar image same image and uh, the other two simpson and jerry are different so that's how you will do and the guy who's responsible for labeling is kind of bored looks bored he's like not happy with his job but that's what he has to do so yeah so we have we would like to focus on a box which we don't know what it is but that's what is going to be the automatic labeling mechanism so we would like to replace the guy with some automatic mechanism will which will do this for us so um what what could be the idea it's like let's say we have you know a very basic function you know which can tell us it's same or different based on the images and we can use always uh, some some uh, neural network models which are called encoders which uh, is uh, in, in a in a simple words it could be like something like dimensionality reduction we have an image which has three channels red green and blue and then we basically take these values uh, pixel values and then we reduce the dimensions by using a neural network which acts as an encoder and then we get a like a lower dimension of a representation and then we say okay how similar or different are these two representations from each other so maybe some if you have something like this then we can like solve this problem so yes so that is where we come to this point where we say okay we have an idea which is called contrastive learning uh, I, will, I will we will go into these details of what contrastive really means but uh, we probably must have got the gist of what it is going to be like so the idea is very simple uh, based on what i said but then there is some logistics uh, how do you define the problem how do you set this up how do you train and so on and obviously with any uh, neural network based deep learning problem uh, we always have these uh, you know uh, intricacies and we have to like look into those so that's what i'll be doing uh, with the sim clr framework um, so I've broken down the original problem in four subparts, uh, and we'll be looking at them one by one, and then we'll look at the complete model in the end. So let's begin with an image. Uh, we have an image, the same smiley face on yellow box, and then we do some kind of transformation. So as on the top, you see the transformation is that we have cropped it, we have changed the color, uh, and then we have also like try to fit it back in the original dimension but then uh, there are some pixels uh, especially this area in the in the bottom which doesn't have any color information and the second transformation is different than the first transformation again we have cropped but then we have inverted it and then we have done something with the colors as well so we have like probably reduce the pixel values and yeah we have done something with the so we have done some some kind of color transformation so random crop resize color distortion and so on so then we get like two different so we kind of augment this image right so we have suddenly we have like double the times of the input images that we already had now what we do is um so these these arrows are basically like uh being carried forward so now we have these two different uh, images and then we plug them into something called resonate so residual networks so uh, i will not describe what it is uh, if you don't have an idea but then uh, you can like always read about it it is it is a type of um, uh, network which is uh, which is very famous and being used in uh, in computer vision tasks so resnet 50 is is what 
what uh, the the authors of this paper used and then um, so then this is this is basically what an encoder is right so encoder i should have drawn like a funnel kind of structure here because uh, what it does is like it reduces the dimension of your image and then you get like a, a lower dimensional dimensional representation called latent representation which looks like i'm sorry for the image looks like a battery here so hi and hj represents each of those images that we saw in the previous slide that comes out from something called pooling layer and then we get that representation as h uh, index <clears throat> so far so good uh so the next thing what we do is now we take that representation and plug it in another uh single layer neural network uh, they call it projection head uh so this is a mlp with uh, relu activation uh relu is one of those uh non-linear activations that uh, people use in neural networks there are others uh, what it does is basically pushes the values towards a certain direction you know if it's so really what it does is if it's below certain value it pushes it to uh, to zero and if it's not then it kind of maintains the original value so that's what this is uh mlp with one layer and then we get that we get another representation uh z z i g z j from h i h j and then we basically minimize the loss here so this is where we basically did, uh, we try to like um, do contrastive learning. So let's look at the last slide. This is what it looks like. Um, so um, now you can see the full picture. Uh, you take an image, you transform it, you plug it in the ResNet, you take that representation. I'll look. I'll get into these tasks later on. Then again, we plug this H into MLP and then we get Z, I, Z, J, and then we minimize the loss. Uh, so the loss is here, the contrastive learning loss, uh, we we'll look into this as well. And basically later on when we train this network, we would like to make use of this by, 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 by using these learn parameters to do some inference task or some downstream tasks and that for that purpose we don't use the mlp uh, layer and we just like use the representation layer uh, which comes directly after the resonant part and then we can do any kind of downstream tasks, tasks that we want uh, there's a bit of a theory behind why this is done in this way uh, you can always you know get in touch with us we can discuss this because this is a very interesting topic for us so uh, yeah, we love to discuss. So if, you, if you're interested in theory, why is it done, done in this way? You know, why did they use MLP with one layer? Uh, can we exclude that part? Can we not use the MLP or can we basically use the representation after the MLP? Will it work fine with the downstream tasks? Uh, these are very good questions. If you, if, you, if you come across and if you feel that you need to finance for these, definitely can look on the internet or get in touch with us well um, so this is how it is trained uh, and uh, especially the contrastive loss or the contrastive learning that I said uh, that happens after the MLP is is again something like here this is again a simplified version uh, where I previously mentioned it, it could be same or same or different and now yeah, I say okay cosine similarity but although it's not the final case but um, we can also imagine something like we have two vectors and then we take a dot product of these two vectors, normalized vectors. Um, what we get is, uh, let's say we, do have, we have two vectors, we get values between, for a simplified first, you know, vectors lying in first quadrant, we get uh, values between zero and one. So uh, if they are orthogonal uh, to each other, then we get like zero if they are, uh, closer to each other the angle between them is uh, acute or small and we get values close to one so the loss function there is again something like that uh, it is kind of a negative log of this term here uh, it looks a bit complicated but then uh, you can imagine the same or different function is an exponential function so it's a it's, a, it's an index for an, for an exponential value and you basically plug that in as the numerator. So you take image A and B, which are two transformed images, uh, augmented images, 
and then you compare that with all the images that has been uh, that have been compared so far so um, this is how more or less it will look like and then basically you do this twice so because you're comp not only comparing a with b but you're also comparing b with a and so on so you get a numerical value for this and this is your loss function value this is your cost for the for the model uh, and then what you do is you basically work on that through training and then you can use a lot of other techniques to to uh, basically improve the performance of your model but this is what uh, the the objective function looks like so this is the exact version of it it's a negative log of something which looks like softmax but not exactly the softmax because this um, yeah because it's the similarity index between the two latent representation which is also divided by a temperature hyperparameter but uh, nevertheless uh, the output should be something like this here so you have a source image and you have all a bunch of other images right you have got simpson here jerry bean and other transformed version of the original image and then the output should be like the value for that image is the highest as compared to the, the other ones so you can like find a threshold and say uh, the image here is basically similar to this one and uh, as mentioned uh, we should do it twice because we are comparing a to b and again b to a so again this is a very very simplified uh, representation uh, i'm sorry if you get annoyed by this but um, you can say that uh, there is some hypersurface there is some boundary between your classes and then you know ideally you want all the red dots to be together and green dots to be away from them so the contrastive part here is that you train not only to find all the similar images be clustered together but you also focus on uh, trying to force the dissimilar images being as far as possible from your from your own cluster so basically you're putting efforts in both directions in order to like you know um, in order to get the best performance you are you're trying to bring the similar images together and dissimilar images as far as possible so yeah what can you use it for this is the more interesting part uh, before i get into the applications um, i want to reiterate the fact that we don't use the mlp and the representation that come after that so we don't use t or yeah z i z j we use h i h j and uh this can be used for um, different um, tasks like scalable framework for hyper dimensional environment complex stuff uh, multi-class object classification online adaptation and disentangle the abstract dimensions that matter so we'll be looking at one or two examples from these and um yeah, and you can also um, basically change the dimensions of the of the resonant itself, right? Because now more or less it looks like this part, the encoder part, is very very important in this in this model. So you can always change the the hidden vector, uh, the the hidden layer dimension. You can change the width of this network, and you can you can do a bunch of other experiments to see what fits the best. And I will I will come back on this uh, in in the last I think last or second last slide, like how does it matter if we change the width or the uh, size of the hidden layer and how, how does it affect the performance of the model so let's look at the first example um so okay i'm sorry the title is misleading so don't look at that but uh this is again um um a self-supervised learning project you can always look at this project on sarmanet.github.io imitation uh, we'll be on this slide for some time so you can note this down if you're interested so what they do here is they also include the uh the temporal factor in in the problem now you're not just looking at the representation the visual rep the basically training your contrastive loss network on a visual representation but also now you have a temporal factor in which uh, makes it even more interesting because now you can basically take the video stream of the same 
action being done from two view view frames right so this is like probably taken from the front of the person and this is taken from the opposite side so and the person is kind of doing the same thing but then uh, what we can do is we can have an anchor point which is here so we are like kind of looking into this as an anchor point and then we say that frame in the other video stream could be your positive uh class for this anchor point and then a frame sometime later on where you know the mug is the glass is fully filled and then there's no more liquid in the in the white glass then that is like a negative because that kind of represents something else so that could be your negative uh, class so this is a bit more extended version of the previous loss that we saw now because we have to include this temporal factor so we what we see is we increase the uh, similarity again between the anchor point and the positive class by this part here while decreasing the or by, by increasing the dissimilarity between the anchor point and the negative class and then it's basically uh, adjusted by some margin and then some other hyperparameters but then this is what a triplet loss looks like so this is um one of the example where we can use the uh we can use this contrastive loss kind of networks for in a real time application so we can we can say that okay in these two video streams the action that is done by maybe the same object or group of objects is is the same the second one is uh, again uh, again the extended version of the previous slide uh, that uh this is some interesting research that happened i think also in the last year that what we can do is we can use videos from two so two video streams from same object from same uh, subject or uh, maybe we can also use the simulation video like sim simulation video streams or in the in the right here you can see we can only use single video and then uh, the network bit becomes a little bit complex now we are not only using the time contrastive networks tcn but we are also using uh, we are also combining that with the reinforcement learning approach where um, we first learn the representation uh, using the tcn but then we plug those representation as as one of the inputs to the rl model uh, the reinforcement learning problem which is another type of machine uh, machine learning domain where uh, the progress is driven by the agents or the subjects experience in the environment so we kind of like um, affect the agents get affected by the rewards or the penalties uh, by the actions taken by the agent in the in the in the environment so such representations are uh, one of the inputs to your rl problem and then it learns some policies the way you set this problem up to animate uh, characters in the virtual world as here you see in the simulation so this person is trying to like do something like squats free weights uh, free body squats i mean something like that and then the animation in uh, the simulation is very close to that uh, although the the morphology or the structure of the body is pretty different and then uh, they also can do this regression over by like doing the control like regression to join the controls so to to control the joints of the virtual agent in the real world here so uh this is this i found very exciting so i wanted to include this example here second one is now again uh, this real to real uh, which is uh the video stream is an input and then the robot basically can um can open the door just the way the human opens it on the left so this is what uh, we this are one of some of the interesting examples of the applications obviously there is always further room for improvement um yeah and we are i think towards the end of the presentation today for today so this is what sim clr is uh, the the framework that we saw today and then if we can we can always increase the width of the network as i said and the performance increases and uh, pay attention that uh, if for for 4x sim clr it is very close to what supervised learning does which is a really uh, fascinating uh, thing to look forward to because now 
the unsupervised learning approach is getting closer and closer to the supervised learning. Uh, by the way, this this approach is, comes from the from Jeffrey Hinton's lab. He's also named like the father of AI. So uh, yeah, obviously this is uh, really cool. And uh, here are some other approaches that have been done in the past. So there's MoCo, it's like momentum contrast, and then there's Pearl here, there's CMC and so on. So these are other approaches you can probably like take a screenshot of this if you're interested in this particular branch or we'll also upload the video. So this has been one of the fascinating research uh, as Nathan mentioned in the beginning. Uh, it's really fun to you know see something as exciting as this. And uh, on the right, you can see that you can basically take the ResNet uh, architecture for the embedding, but you can also change the number of uh, hidden units. So you can see like as the hidden unit unit uh, or decreases, the performance kind of like goes down. So they have done a bunch of studies here. So there's a lot of things happening in this graph. So they are not only changed the number of hidden units, but they are also, you can see if there's something, the bracket, it's about, you know, what's the width of the network. So more or less, if you have, I think 50 is a good number because uh, they have also gone for 101 and 152, which has kind of like equivalent performance. So 50 was a good number maybe. And uh, for four times the width, and then on the right, you can see the epochs, the number of epochs that they have trained this uh, model on. So if you basically increase the number of epochs, go up to thousand, then you know you get performance even better than the ones which are trained on less number of epochs. So yeah, this is what uh, we wanted to share for today. Uh, so what is the conclusion? So we kind of like go back to our main point, we need data, but we, need, we are starting to find ways to deal with this lack of high quality data properly. And then there is definitely a room for improvement. Maybe we can extend the existing formulation. We can come up with something even more interesting. And then when we do this, we get very cool results, just the way we, I showed you. So that was it for today. Uh, and thank you for attending today's session. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us through the kthis.com website or the email mentioned here.